What's up guys? In this video, I'm just going to be talking about various topics in regards to chapter 15. While I'm talking, I'm just going to leave a no UR run of 154 lethal running in the back. Not a full clear, of course. First things first, I want to show that the boss debuff and out of ammo debuffs actually stacked at a certain point in time, and that I was not just having a bout of schizophrenia, because apparently the interaction was not guaranteed to occur every time. From what I heard, it seems like it was entirely possible to go through all the stages in chapter 15 without encountering the stacking bug. In case you didn't know, the debuff you get from engaging the boss, which reduces your damage output by 30%, and increases the amount you take by 30%, is only supposed to apply to subsequent boss fights with the same fleet, and not to the mob nodes as well. However, I found out yesterday as I was progressing through the stage that it was actually having an effect on the mob fights, which made things much more difficult than I originally anticipated. Here is my Musashi's gun's regular damage against a light armor enemy, approximately 4.5 thousand. And here is what it looks like when out of ammo. As expected, it's about 50% of the damage of what it normally is. And here is what I experienced yesterday when the debuffs were stacked together. Somehow, I was dealing less than 30% of the original damage with the same equipment. It was a bit strange seeing as I was not dealing exactly 20% of the base damage as you would expect from a sum of 50% and 30% damage reduction, but nevertheless it was definitely a much stronger debuff than 50%. When I encountered this interaction, it was pretty much impossible to win a single fight. As a result, in both the 15-3 and 15-4 auto full clears which I uploaded, I engaged the enemy in a pretty non-conventional order. The bug has been fixed since then, so you don't really have to worry about it, but I will still go over the strategy I used to circumvent the obstacle when I did my clears. You can just skip ahead to the general tips if you want. In chapter 15-3, for a normal clear, I would first do 3 fights to summon the boss, then engage the boss with my mob fleet, and then fight one more mob fleet while debuffed by the boss. At this point, my mob fleet had both debuffs stacked, so I did the last mob fight with my boss fleet instead. Fortunately, the boss fights are relatively easy in comparison to the mob fights, so it's not a big deal for the boss fleet to do an extra fight. To full clear 15-3, I first engaged all the mob fleets on the field before engaging the boss for the first time. After engaging the boss, the mob fleet had both debuffs, so there's no choice but to switch to the boss fleet for the final two mob fights and then the boss. Hence I brought Volga as well as anti-submarine equipment even on my boss fleet, just in case an escort node spawned after the first boss encounter. To full clear 15-4, I first engaged all the mobs without picking up the ammo. Then I did the first boss encounter with my boss fleet, and went back to my mob fleet, still out of ammo, to do the next two mob fights. Then, when the second boss fight spawned, I picked up the ammo to engage the boss with my mob fleet, now with ammo. After the second boss encounter, my mob fleet now had the debuff from the boss, but crucially, it now had ammo, and thus was able to defeat the final mob node summoning the boss for my boss fleet, which only had done one fight and was not debuffed. I did not realize that there was only one more mob fight after the second boss encounter, so I actually picked up the ammo one fight late, resulting in one extra ammo remaining after finishing the full clear. It was a pretty fun experience. At first, I did not realize what was happening with the debuff stacking and thought it was just impossible to full clear, but after I realized the reason I was failing and found the strategy to get around it, it became easier to full clear both 15.3 and 15.4 than 14.3 on release. Between 15.3 and 15.4, I found 15.4 to be more difficult to full clear. Again, the debuff should now be fixed, so you can just engage the boss with your mob fleet and continue using it even when out of ammo. Next, let's talk about ship choices. The carrier support fleet only sends out fighters and literally does nothing else, so you just want the carriers who send out the most fighters. I'll leave that for you to find out for yourself. The most important ship is unsurprisingly Unicorn. I haven't bothered to try any mob fleet without Unicorn yet. If you're open to using dupes of the same ship, before duping QRs, I would honestly consider Unicorn, which would make both fleets available to easily take on at least 5 fights. Uncapping 2 Unicorns will cost you a total of 200 COG arrays, while uncapping 1 extra UR will cost you 225 COG arrays, 
so that's something to take into consideration as well. Another mainstay is independence in my boss fleet. With her insane AA capabilities and good surface damage as well, while buffing carriers in both fleets. Although I don't think she is as irreplaceable as Unicorn. Next up is one of Musashi or Bismarck. You don't need both of them. As you can see in the most recent No UR153 clear, as well as the video that is going on in the background right now, Triple Carrier is totally viable for the boss fleet. Therefore, you only really need one of the two battleships for your mob fleet, and even then they're not required for clearing this stage. For full clears, they're most likely a necessity, but as you can see, Hood works completely fine for just clearing the stage. I didn't even need to reset or call my submarines at every opportunity. Next, having 2 out of 3 of Shimanto, Cheshire, and San Diego will make your life much easier. You only need 2 of them, and Shimanto is not mandatory. Each one has their own merits and drawbacks. Shimanto deals the most damage out of the 3 while also being tanky enough to tank 1 or 2 fights if your tank gets too low as you're going through the stage. She also increases the survivability of your entire fleet. San Diego has a high enough anti-submarine stat that by bringing her, you can forego bringing a dedicated destroyer for ASW. Since she covers both AA and ASW by herself, you can use ships that are strong when paired, such as Yat-Sen and Harbin, which otherwise would not be able to find two spots if you have one destroyer dedicated to ASW and then another ship dedicated to AA. Cheshire is tanky, although I'm not sure she is tankier than Shimanto. The one exceptional thing she has going for her is that she is the cutest out of the three in my opinion. Past the few ships I just explicitly mentioned, the rest of the slots in both fleets have many options you can consider. Some of the ones I tried with success include Brest, Plymouth, Anchorage, Sela, Jervis, Janus, Shimakaze, Unzen, Hindenburg, Yatsen, Harbin, and secondary healers with decent damage and AA, such as Aquila and Volga. Some ships I have not tried but I believe could have some good potential are Hanman 2, whose entire kit is super relevant in the chapter but is a bit too squishy for my liking, Illustrious and John Dark for a Vanguard survival, and then FDG and UVH. Oh, and before I forget to mention, Kirsarge was pretty good as well. I should mention that, while I believe battleships deal more damage than carriers that are not stealth, the difference between air superiority and air supremacy can be easily felt by your vanguard, so I always prioritized achieving air supremacy before anything else, leading to at most two battleships across both fleets. Next, I'm gonna discuss equipment. I approach the issue from a problem solving point of view. So first I start with a goal, either just beating the stage or full clearing it, and I really only care enough to achieve it. I think this is a better approach than starting by thinking, hmm, what is the most optimal equipment I can use? Which is an ever-changing goal with plenty of room for debate. For instance, the FW190 was quite popular on the first day and many people ran 6 of them for the support carrier fleet. But I heard that people are now moving onto Flapjack even for the support carrier fleet. I have no clue how the calculus plays out between reload, flight speed, and raw AA output of the fighters. So instead of thinking about that, I just used what I had and checked if it worked. If it hadn't worked, I would have probably crafted some FW190s. But since I was not having too many issues with AA in general, I just used some combination of Skyrockets and Flapjacks. I have no clue if Skyrockets are actually better than Flapjacks, or if FW190 are just way better than both. But either way, as long as it works, I'm not going to bother to fuss about it. For submarines, you should really consider whether or not to remove pressure hull. I think the enemies are close enough that they'll be in range even without it, and when the submarines surface, you want them to be further back to decrease their chance of dying. Similarly, you'll probably want to use a snorkel on ships that usually don't need it, such as Da Vinci, U-37, and Archerfish, so they spend more time submerged. For the Vanguard, torpedoes do seem to be a problem, so torpedo bulges are a pretty good option. I've made two for Jinsu meta and didn't bother making more for chapter 15, but they could easily be better than the loadouts I used. Don't copy me and feel free to craft more if you feel that torpedoes are giving you a lot of trouble. You of course need anti-submarine warfare, just like chapter 14, and since you had to clear chapter 14 to get to chapter 15, I'm sure that doesn't need to be explained at this point. In terms of AA guns, you can't really go wrong with stacking as many rainbow AAs as possible. Otherwise, the same principles that apply to chapter 13 still apply here. 
Putting Flapjack and Wyvern on all your carriers will also go a long way in making sure you don't get blasted by enemy planes. Past that, I feel like there isn't much left to say. Anyway, as time passes, I'm sure more things will come up and I'll continue making content about chapter 15. Overall, I did enjoy the chapter after realizing the way to get around the debuff stacking, and found it to be easier than on release chapter 14. Unfortunately, there is pretty much nothing worth farming aside from the Houston drop, as the gold reward is nothing exceptional, and there's no new limited loot like gold plates or cognitive arrays, so I don't really see much of a reason to spend much time in the sage, at least until auto clear is added. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.